Um, do you all have your final exams with you? Except for Sylvie. <laughs> Everyone else, do you have your final exam in front of you? You've already picked it up. Let's give them back because they want to check the dictation. Sorry. One. Do you want to watch my mouth just in case? You still need some cues here. One. Tick. Two. Tack. Three. Tuck. Four. Talk. Five. Took. Six. Tech. Seven. Take. Eight. Talk. Nine. Toke. Ten. Teak. Do you know what all the words mean? I'm guessing you don't know this one. This one means a drag on marijuana. Isn't that a ridiculous word? OK, a toke. And teak is yomu. Tech is short for technical. And those are not really correct spellings, but they're plausible, so those are OK, too. And this is a nishengzi, tick tock the sound that a clock makes. Any questions? Does anybody want anything repeated? Yes or no? No, we're done. OK. So everything's in order now? Then you can give your exams back. Thank you. And do you all now have copy, a copy of vowels and consonants? Everybody has a copy? No problems with that? OK, and then I will collect your sums on Wednesday. And you should come to class prepared with what? Any questions that you have, right? And you know, what that leaves is our textbook. We're going to work hard on our textbook. So let's start. <laughs> what? <laughs> Excited? <laughs> hmm. OK. Last time we learned about what kinds of sounds? Ejectives, right. And I keep mentioning Georgia because I've been there and I am interested in the language and the country and the culture. But ejective also makes me think of another thing besides the way they pronounce certain words, the at, ap, ah. And that is my Georgian teacher, one of my Georgian teachers kept saying adjectives, adjectives, but it wasn't ejectives, it was adjectives. She was teaching us Georgian, and I kept hearing adjectives. I thought, we're not talking about phonetics here. We're talking about grammar, but she meant adjectives. In Taiwan, many people make the same mistake. They say adjectives instead of adjectives. I don't know if you've ever heard that, but I'm just letting you know. Make sure you put the stress on the right word. You have to be polite to your teacher, but I, got, I couldn't take that one. It was confusing me. I said, excuse me, it's adjectives. Adjectives. <laughs> OK, um, so adjectives. Adjectives, ejectives, I think are both, are, are both OK. And you may have noticed, if you've been to our web page, that I've put up some Chinese translations for some of these terms. And most of these terms, I think a lot of the terms in the book I do know in Chinese, but some of them I don't. Or some of them I look, at, I look them up and then I forget. And one reason I forget is because there is often not an established translation for a lot of these things. You find seven different translations. And then you don't know which one to use, so you stick with the English, because there's only one English, basically. Actually, there is more than one in English. You can call them glottalized consonants. You could also call them that. It's less precise, but they are sometimes simply called that. And you'll see that reflected in the Chinese here. So the Chinese, we often get many. And I didn't even put all of the ones up that I found. One of them says, uh, for ejective, why bao yin? Why is aggressive? And bao yin is just plosive. It's an aggressive plosive. So I don't think that one is really that specific. Another one is jin ho yin. And that means that you are making your throat very tight. So you have to make it tight in order to produce an ejective because your, your glottis, your vocal folds are coming together. And they're going to make sure that no air comes out from the lungs and then push the air above it, above them out. So jin ho yin is another translation. And another one is pen yin, pen yin, pen zhe pen. And I can't say I like any of them. I guess wai bao yin is the closest that we can get wai bao yin, but it's not really that precise. So that's the problem with learning the Chinese for some of these. 
you can do some research on your own on Google, and most of the translations come from the PRC. You don't find as many from Taiwan. Um, uh, why Bao Yin? So anyway, you can, look, you can do some research yourself and see if you can find a better one that you are happier with. But that's what I've found so far. And then for creaky voice, that's a fun translation. That's zhi ga yin. Yiga kou, yiga zhi chi de zhi. Nan hou, yiga kou, yiga yu bian shi gan ga de ga de yu bian. Zhi ga yin. And the other ones we haven't really, breathy voice we haven't really covered yet. That's just qi yin or qi sheng yin. And bao yin and bao fa yin for plosive. We talked about that before. Stop is se yin, plosive is bao yin. So that's the Chinese for a few of the terms that we've been running into. Let's continue from where we left off. Whose turn? Very good. Okay, and then tell us where we are in the book and start. Hey, page 139. That's fine, but is it 100? Everybody listen carefully. Is it 100? Why? What's the difference? No. Nasal. Well, there is a nasal. That's the point. How can we describe the difference? We should be able to describe things that we do in pronunciation, both the correct pronunciations and Taiwan English mistakes. 100, 100. What's the difference? In 100, can you describe the sound? 100. The vowel is nasalized, but the vowel is also nasalized in 100. One, one. Because we have that rule we learned last semester. Before a nasal, any vowel gets nasalized. So if you say that alone, it's not quite enough. How can we describe it more precisely? 100. The vowel is longer. But we could go 100, and it's still not the same thing. It's very easy. Right. We have no contact with the alveolar ridge by the tip of the tongue. Right? So you didn't have alveolar contact with the tip of the tongue. Then it comes out 100. Um, so I'll be catching things like these. Put that in your list of things to add to your schedule for correction because every time now I think of something like this that I've explained many times, I look at Amy. Oh, do we have to go over this again? Okay, I don't know if you get fun. I know that I repeat things not because I forget I said them, but because it seems that some people haven't gotten them yet. And I see looks on people's faces like, oh, I didn't know that before even though I've said it three times, because I know in my own learning, I don't necessarily learn things the first time. If we learn things easily the first time, why is that usually? Sometimes we learn things easily the first time. Because, because. <coughs> Anybody? If we learn something easily the first time and we hear it, what might be the reason for that? It's new. It's new? Well, everything is new in theory if we're learning it. It's different from our Okay, you're saying that it's unusual enough that it strikes us, and that's true about learning. Things that are really different from our experience, we'll remember them more easily because other things, if they're similar to what we already know, we tend to mix them up and forget them, right? So that is one possibility. It's so unusual that we remember it because it's so odd. It's so unlike our previous experience. What's another reason we might remember when just hearing something once? And by the way, these points that we're bringing up now are important to those of you especially who plan to teach. Because if you want to make an impression that lasts, you should know what sticks. I read a book called Made to Stick, I think was the title, Made to Stick. I think that's what it was. And it tells all about what we remember best. So if you want to learn things and change habits, you have to remember things. And this tells you what kinds of things people remember best. This is especially designed for 
people who are running an ad campaign and they want to give a message that people remember. So if it's so unusual, you know, that it really sticks out in our mind, yeah, we'll probably remember it. What else? What's another reason? Yeah, and that confirms it, or it explains it. That means maybe we've noticed something all our lives, but only half consciously. And suddenly somebody mentions it and gives it a name, you go, oh, that's what it is. I thought it was just me. But it turns out everybody has the same thing. We've given it a name, and the reason is because we've already experienced it and thought about it, so it's familiar to us already. And that's pretty much what I was after. In order to re remember something, to understand it well enough to remember it, we need to have enough background. We need to have just the right number of steps that take us right to the doorway of learning the new thing. If we're missing those steps, like if we're trying to get from here, there are two steps here, and then there's a door up here on the second floor. Can we get up to the second floor? We have only two steps here, and then nothing, and then there's the second floor doorway. We can't get up there unless you can really jump and you might get hurt. So with learning, you have to have step-by-step -step background or the teacher has to provide you with those steps to get you right to the doorway in order for you to understand it and then remember it. So in those cases, usually we have that background. It fits in with your background. You already have enough steps to understand it easily. Okay? So when something is too new and too different, we don't quite register it. It doesn't we don't thoroughly understand it and once we understand it we may not keep it because it is too different from our previous experience. The reason we might remember some things is also a reason why we can't really accept it because we were taught something else. We have habits that are blocking out the new information and those habits are very very powerful as we've discussed before. So if those habits are blocking out something new and this new thing you haven't totally embraced, you don't totally accept it yet, You've heard your teacher say it, you understand it cognitively, but you haven't embraced it and your old habits are going to say, well, this is the way I've always done it, and then you forget it quickly. That's what I think happens when I do pronunciation corrections most often. Like 100, I think I've told you before in class last semester, except there's something more powerful than the new knowledge, which is your existing habits. And that's why when I tell it to you again, and Amy's going, oh, not again. The rest of you are saying, oh, yeah, oh, that's how it works. Oh, okay. And maybe the third time you'll think, well, maybe I should change it. Often it's not until the third time. And that applies to learning new vocabulary words. You'll hear people say that, like when you're for the GRE or something. The first, you know, the word is very strange. And then you hear it two more times, and then, hey, you start remembering it. So a lot of times when I repeat things is because you're still in that process of building up the background or dealing with your previous habits. Okay, excuse me, I've taken time away from this, but this is important to all kinds of learning. A lot of you are in the, in the teaching program, and even for those of you who are not, we all need to know more about how we learn so we can learn more efficiently. And one thing I hope to make more efficient is when I make a correction that you can build steps leading to it, put it in your notes, and then the daily program, your weekly program, will help you work on the old habits. Okay, so 100. We only talked about the page number. Let's go. And we're on 139? The second paragraph. Okay, go. And did you identify yourself? Uh, Tina. Okay. The next step is hmm? to... The next what? Step. 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 Right. How do we know it's step and not state? There is a word state, by the way. But it's, in, it's got an S on it. I've never heard state by itself. It's a part of the ear. This is the body part. It's called the stapes. So there is such a word. It would help to learn a little phonics. Because if you see A plus a silent E at the end, you know it's pronounced like the name of the letter A. But if it's just S, T, let's say it was A. How would we pronounce that? I don't think that's a word, but. Right, just like the word staff, for example, which is a word. That's the so-called short A in phonics, which is our 蝴蝶 A. You don't see an E at the end, 
And in addition, S, T, let's say it's E, E, P. We don't usually have a final silent E with E. We often, we can, but we often have a double E instead or we have an E, A. For example, meat. Then it's going to be, so wait, a long E is what? E. But if it's only one E, it's going to be, it's going to be E. Eh. So in the future, when you see just a single letter E and then a consonant, nothing else, usually it's going to be this. So for those of you who haven't learned phonics, how about if you do that yourself? We can't do it in class. It's too much, and it's not directly related to what we're doing. But phonics will really help you. It will save you a lot of bother. You won't have to go to the dictionary constantly. And you can guess sounds fairly correctly, at least part of the time. Let's go. Um, is to learn uh, to the next state. Hmm? State. No. Step. How do we pronounce step. this letter? Step. This this symbol. Step. That's right. The next state. Hmm? Step. All right. What was that? That was habit. Habit is tough, <laughs> isn't it? It is so hard to overcome because is it system one or system two that is um, deciding our behavior? System one is the automatic brain. System two is the analytic brain. So which which part of the brain is usually helping us when we're reading? Automatic. System one, the automatic brain. So it will take a lot of work to get over that habit because you've probably been doing it many years. So you're going to have to put that in your notes, put it in your weekly program and work on it. Once more. The next step mm -hmm. is, is to learn to in superimpose this movement on a velar stop. OK, say Anna again. Anna. Anna. Um, it sounds like anga to me. It may not be wrong, but the vowel quality is somehow wrong. It sounds like you're saying anga. Um, remember that when we are reading these short words like prepositions and we have a uh after them. A uh is a vowel so we can link. And to get rid of the ang problem, is a velar. We don't even say a nasal at all. We just say a. Ah. And then where do we put the nasal? at the beginning of the next word. Ah, no. Ah, no nasal at all. It's fine. We do nasalize it, but if we don't nasalize it, nobody cares. So, ah, no. Everyone? Ah, no. Ah, no. Yeah, nobody will say ah, no if you're saying ah, no. Ni, no? Nigga, no. Nobody will say ni, no. Right? Nobody says ni, no. So you won't get it wrong. Ni, no. Ah, no. And how about I, N, uh? Not e, uh. No. Got it? That's the formula. Put that down. Okay, sorry, Amy. But a, uh, na, u, uh, na, then you won't say anga and inga, and that's typical Taiwan English. Everyone? A, uh, na. A, uh, na. Very good. Once more. A, uh, na. Mm, there you go. Wheeler stop. Mm hmm. Wheeler stop. Wheeler stop. Mm hmm. Say the sequence ak. Good. Then say this sequence again. Very slowly. Again. Again. Good. Very slowly. Good. Holding holding your tongue in the position for the Posi position. Po position. Not position. 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 You're saying posi. It's posi. Or it or the i. Position. Position. It's a little better, yeah. For the closure at the end for the for the second or so. At the end, for a second or so. At the end, for a second or so. All right, and one more thing, everybody. What's wrong here? At the, at the, should be? At the, and there's a long pause there. Even though those are sheets and very short. At the, at the, and then there's end, so we need to say the instead of the. So at the end, and yoga yi de lian yin. Everyone, at the end. At the end. Good, at the end. Yeah. That's good. Okay, Tina? Oh, but I want, I want you to do the part after closure. The position for, for the... the posi 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 position. That's better. For the closure at the end for a second or so. That was really good. <clears throat> One more thing. How do we say k closure? How do we stress it? Is, it sounds ridiculous, but k is a noun. Yes, you got it. 
Isn't that funny? Because k is not even a word. It's just a sound, but it's still a noun. So um, we would say for the k closure, for the k closure. Now that's something most teachers would not stop you for and point out. It's kind of crazy, but k is a noun. Go ahead. Now, say again. Mm, okay. And Wait a minute, while. how about linking? Do you see a place where you should link? Um, say it. Say it is good. Okay, one more linking after that. Um, say it the, the again. Ah, okay. Can you put it in the phrase? Now, say it again. Not say it. Don't put a false tap after say. The tap goes after or between it and again. Listen. Now, say it again. Say it, uh, say it, uh, say it, uh, say it. Uh. Now, say it again. I'm being really picky with you this morning, okay? This will give you some, some material for your schedule, for your pronunciation correction schedule. Now, say it again. Now, say it again. Beautiful. And while maintaining mm -hmm. the... I could see trouble before that one came out. This is a typical Taiwan problem. Yeah. All right, AI for phonics again. If you see AI in spelling, usually it's pronounced. Right, exactly, you got it. Well, men tending. Mm -hmm. But you didn't say A, you said E. Eh. You said men. Men. Mm -hmm. Men tending yeah. the K closure. There you go. Do, through, do, do three things. Good. One, make a glottal stop. Two, if you can, raise if your... If you can. If you can. Good. Raise your larynx. And three, release the cut closure while man maintaining huh? the glottal stop. I'm glad you stopped, but you can make it better. While... While maintaining... If the first one is good, do the second one the same. Maintaining... Now the second one is good. Do both of them. While... Maintaining. Mm -hmm. You're saying men. We want. Maintaining. First one is good. It's good to should be. You, you get this one right, and then the other one pops up. Maintain. Whenever you focus on one, the other one goes back to your old habit. Can you see what's happening? It's not something wrong with you. It's just what happens with people. So when you're paying attention to the first syllable, you're saying maintaining. Then the second one's wrong. Then I say, well, you have to get the second one, too. And then you say, maintaining. And you get the second one right, and the first one's wrong. But you need to concentrate on both this time, because they're both A-E. Maintain. I can tell exactly which, which syllable you're focusing on. Again? Maintaining. Did it. OK. The glottal stop. Mm -hmm. Don't worry about. Mm -hmm. Stop it stops. Don't, don't worry about. Step. There's another stop. About yes, you know how fun. Try it again. Don't worry about step too, too much. Good. The important thing is important. Important mm -hmm. thing to concentrate on is having a glottal stop and a velar closure. Velar. Velar mm -hmm. closure going on at the same time. At the same time. Mm -mm. Same. Same yes. Time. Mm -hmm. And then releasing the vela closure. And, 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 and what? And then releasing. Yes. The first time you said, I heard, and then releasing, it was just like the problem with what? I'm going to be in the fine 100. 100, then releasing. See, yang the wen ti. Uh huh. And then? Uh, releasing the vela closure. That's one. And don't make the e too long. And I, I mentioned this in another class. It's not releasing. It's releasing. Wait, anyway, s is not. It's not voiced, so it's releasing. And then releasing. Releasing the vela mm, closure. The and then releasing. And then releasing. Good. The vela closure before releasing the glottal stop. All right. Two things there. Um, first of all, you see something in italics, right? When you see italics, what should you do? Stress. That means 
we don't normally mark stress in, in English writing, but when we really, really want to emphasize something, we often will either underline it, we'll use bold, or we'll use italics if it's in shua ti. So, then releasing the, go ahead. The velar closure. The velar closure. Velar just like a it's This is not a compound. The velar closure before releasing the glottal stop. All right, and glottal stop is also a compound, like vocal folds. Glottal stop. Glottal stop. All right. The One. release of the velar closure. Velar closure. Remember, velar just a chance. Yeah. Will produce only a very small noise, but it will be an. But it. But it mm -hmm. will be an injective. Okay. Okay, pretty good. One thing I just noticed was, but it will be, but it will be. Again? But it will be. Good, that's excellent. All right, I have a suggestion. <clears throat> okay, mark this paragraph and then practice this because you've gotten a lot of suggestions. And if you fix the problems in this paragraph, I think it will help you in the future because we've already gone over this one. So just go over this on your own in your study time. Practice it and try to fix all of the things in your reading until they come naturally without thinking. Because right now, you have to think hard for each one. And when you get it, it's beautiful, it's perfect. But you have to think hard because it's not habit. So try to make all the corrections in this paragraph habit, okay? And then it will help your other reading because some things will start happen happening naturally after you do that. We need to understand what we just read. Um, some of you can already make objectives, some of you don't yet know how to make them. And this is giving you suggestions on how to do it. So he says, say first of all, ah. Everybody, ah. Uh -huh. And this is T.Y. Hua, but I can't resist. My son's name is Eric. And when my daughter was a baby, she called him ak. Ak. <laughs> so when I see ak, I think of that. Ak. Now, say the sequence again very slowly, holding your tongue in the position for the K closure at the end for a second or so. All right, so ah. Now, you're going to feel tightness in your tummy because you are keeping the air inside. You've got your vocal folds together. You're holding the air in. Zai bing xi. Everyone, ah. Touch your tummy. Ah. Jin jin de ma? It should be. That's ah. And then, what do you want, uh, what should you do? Say it again while maintaining the K closure and while maintaining the K closure, the K closure. Do three things. First of all, you make a glottal stop, which we were already doing. And if you can, raise your larynx. Now, do you remember how to raise your larynx? We practiced last semester and this semester. How do you do it? It sounds like you did it. You're making these noises. You pretend that you're singing what? A very, very high note. So when you said ah, then pretend that you're singing a very high note and your larynx will raise. Ah. You can see it from the side. You can see it in my cheeks. Okay, but remember to breathe. <laughs> okay. Um, so you raise your larynx and then you release the cook closure while maintaining the glottal stop. So you don't let go of that glottal stop. You have a bing shi. To maintain a glottal stop, he means bing xi, to hold your breath. So, you make an ah, you keep your glottis closed. Then you raise your larynx, sing a high note, pretend you are. And then you push out the air, but you can't let air go down your glottis. In other words, you can't open your vocal folds. 还是冰西就对了。冰西就说一个 Alright, so, ah, Ah, raise, push the air out without uh, letting go of your air. 还是holding your breath, the 情况之下. Ah, that's one way to do it. And I'm going to quickly tell you another method that I learned from a different book by William Smalley. <clears throat> and I think I will introduce this book very quickly since we're on the topic, on the index or in the index, way at the bottom, you'll find a link called Book Nook. Okay, I'm not going to turn on the projector because we're not going to need it immediately. It's called Book Nook. 
B O O K book and then N O O K nook nook is a book. Book nook is just a list of phonetics works that I made a long time ago. It's I haven't added to it for quite a long time. But in that list, you will find a book by William Smalley. It's called A Manual of Articulatory Phonetics. It's from 1961. <laughs> 1961. I used it way back when I first took phonetics for practical exercises. And there are also recordings for the book online. At the time, we used reel-to-reel tapes. And it's still useful because he gives um, sounds of many, many different languages, exercises. One problem with the book is that he uses an Americanist system of transcription. He doesn't use IPA. So you have to learn a new system of transcription to use the book. But it's got wonderful examples and recordings. I've got the link also online. On the, it's in the index for both Phonetics 1 and 2. It's a place in Belgium where they've put all of them online. And oh, that was one place that gives uh, a suggestion on how to, uh, how to make um, ejectives. And then there's another book in the same list. There's another book, and I'll find the book later because I don't see it right away now. And the suggestion that they give is pretend that you've got a little piece of leaf on your lips or on your tongue, on the tip of your tongue. right? But then it doesn't taste very good, so you have to spit it out, right? But you want to spit it out because it doesn't taste that good. So pretend there's a little piece of grass on the tip of your tongue and you want to get rid of it. So what will you do? You'll go. Okay, you are now making a labiolingual ejective. Because you are still holding your breath, your glottis is closed. And you're trying to get that piece of grass off your tongue. So, everybody try it. So you're not going to go. You're not going to use long air. You're going to use a glottalic aggressive glottalic mechanism to get rid of that piece of grass. And that's basically how an ejective works. That is one kind of ejective. I don't know of any language that uses that one. <laughs> However, it shows you how to make an ejective. So it's a labiolingual ejective. If you can do the same thing with the other stops, like and and you've got it. OK? So does everybody understand at least the theory of how to do it? you probably also should now be able to produce an ejective yourself. Um, it says don't worry about step two too much, but I think you can all do step two. That's about raising your larynx. And it says that you have to release the velar closure. Okay, let's see what it says so I don't get it wrong. Before releasing the glottal stop. So you have to go before you let air into your lungs. You still have to hold your breath while going That's the point. So hold your breath, and then try to make a K. But don't let go of your breath. You're letting new air into your vocal tract above your glottis. So you can keep on making them until your lungs get tired, until you use up the air in the, your lungs. OK? Some of you have it, no problem. Is there anybody who's still having problems? Okay, if you, okay. We'll, we'll try, we'll work on it during break. But I'm sure you can all learn this. Um, let's go on to the next paragraph. Yumi. Okay. Another way of learning to produce an ejective is to start from the. Mm -hmm. Next, try to. It's second paragraph on 140. Second paragraph. Next. Next, try to produce a vowel after the ejective. This time, start from the sequence. From, watch the M. From mm -hmm. the sequence. 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 Mm -hmm. Aka. Mm -hmm. Say this sequence. Oh, first of all, this, to and say it's not stressed. Say the sequence. Say the sequence mm -hmm. slowly. Right. With a long, long, with a long. All right, everybody. Long, long. All right, long is more British. Long is American. With a long, good, long, long. There we go. 
closure. Mm -hmm. Then, again, du then, then, okay. during this closure, during, during uh -huh. this closure, make, mm -hmm. make, mm -hmm. okay. make a glottal stop. Glottal stop. Glottal stop. Glottal. Glottal stop. Right. Glottal stop. Right. Stop right. and raise the larynx. Good. Then release. Watch the end. Then yeah. release. Release. Release the c closure while still maintaining. Good. <laughs> the glottal stop. Good. Finally, release the glottal stop. 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 And follow it with a vowel. Mm -hmm. You should have. You should have produced something like. We're putting an extra glottal stop in. When this sequence becomes remember not to stress this. When this sequence becomes more fluent, so that there is very little pause between the release of the velar closure and the release of the glottal stop. Release. Release. That's better. It will be simply. It will. Suma. It will be. It will ma. It will it be. It will. Stop. It stops. It will. It will. Right. It will be simply an ejective fo followed by a vowel. Mm -hmm. a a. Okay, you have the right idea. You will need to practice, but I think you're getting that. Okay. There is, of there course. There is, of course. There is, of course. Right. There is, of course, unless it is hmm? uh, still a glottal stop after the release of release, release of the velar stop mm -hmm. and before the vowel. Mm -hmm. But unless it is exceptionally long, long, long. Good. Uh, say it again. I don't think you have long, it. Long, long, long. Ang zang ang. Long. There. Long. There, there we go. We may consider Con. it cons. We may consider it to be implied by the symbol for the ejective. Good. Okay, you made a lot of good corrections. Maintain was amazing. That was great. Maintaining. Mm. You need to watch your th th instead of l. You need to say the this that. But you're making a lot of really good corrections. Um, what are they saying here? Try to produce a vowel after the adjective. Once you're able to make a k sound, we need to put a vowel after it. And ah is probably the easiest one to start with. So, k ah, k ah, k ah. Everyone, k ah. All right, slowly. I was doing it slowly. K ah. That's slow. But it, when you're doing it naturally, it's k ah. K ah. Good. Carol, you can help tutor it. anybody else who needs to work on it. You got it. Exactly. You do it really well. Ka. You got it. Ka. Ka. So remember that yapingshi, you can't let your breath in. Just like when you're swimming, you have to hold your breath, right? And don't let your breath in. Ka. 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 Okay? Carol, can you help anybody who needs help during break? Yeah, you've got it. You've absolutely got it. Mm. It says there is still, of course, uh, there is, of course, still a glottal stop after the release of the velar stop and before the vowel, but unless it is exceptionally long, we may consider it to be implied by the symbol for the adjective. So we don't have to write the glottal stop symbol, is what they're saying. All we need is that apostrophe, and that means it is an adjective. Okay, and it's break time. First of all, as you know, we are keeping up the syllabus week by week, as in last semester, on the Phonetics 2 introductory page. And you can see that for today. Hand in your class notes, your corrected exams we've done. We're working on the book. In addition, here's a new assignment. I want you to read the newest Shida article. It's not published yet, but the draft that I wrote has been approved by the editor. So. This is a readable copy. It's pre-publication. Please read this one. It's all about what? Nasal. Being nasals. And it's only part one. There's a lot of things to say about nasals. I'm now writing part two. But please read this one carefully. 
And I noticed that you may have some issues. You, you fix them well when I pointed them out, but there's some other ones that you maybe need to um, work on on your own because I'm not going to catch every one. So it will address a lot of those nasal issues. M, n, ng, either get mixed up or omitted entirely often in Taiwan English. And it doesn't give as much detail as you're going to get in this class, but there may be some things we don't mention. There are a bunch of examples. And it will be on paper for you, all organized. Well, at least I consider it organized. So read it carefully. Take notes on it. Put the notes in your notes for next Monday. So notes on this article in your class notes for Monday, in addition to your schedule for what you're going to work on this week in your pronunciation. And I told you the no problem story, right? Jangulama. Mayo. Okay, so then I will tell you this story. <laughs> it's at the beginning of the article. But I was listening to ICRT and I was listening to an ad for Yiwen Jiao Cai. And they had a little skit. It was an American guy talking over the phone to a Taiwanese on the other end. He's saying, and I need this translation, ASAP. And then she says, um, no problem. And then, uh, Make sure that you have it on my desk by Monday. Absolutely. And then they hung up. And then someone else in the commercial says, Wow, you're so smart. You're not English very well. All right, it's about listening, but what was the problem with her speaking? Have the translation done, ASAP. And she says, no problem. What was wrong? She didn't close her mouth, right. It should be no problem. And I, I thought this is a really wonderful bit of information I can use for the article. So I picked that up and used it. Because, <laughs> it's not really a good ad for the Jiao Cai if they're going to use the Jiao Cai and say, no problem. <laughs> and absolutely. What's wrong with absolutely? What's wrong with it? Can you describe the problem? Go ahead, Carol. There's an additional vowel, an epithetic schwa, right? An epithetic schwa that we don't want there, absolutely. She doesn't make it that clear, but there's a little hint of it, so it doesn't sound, the timing isn't quite right. So that article is about nasal. So that's the first thing I want to mention. The second thing is a very brief book sharing. I think I've mentioned uh, and when I went to Ruoshui Tang recently, I found this on the shelf. There is an abridged version of his original English, a grammar of spoken Chinese, translated and abridged by Lu Shuxiang. And if you don't know Lu Shuxiang, you should know of him. He's a very, very famous Chinese grammarian, one of the most famous. And then I don't know how good it is because the original is this thick in English, and this is only a tiny book. He says in his introduction that because the original book was written for foreigners, for non-natives of Chinese, there's a lot of information there that is not necessary for native speakers. So this is what he deemed more interesting and relevant to native speakers of Chinese. Now whether it is or not, I don't know, I haven't read it yet. I only read a bit of the introduction. So I'll pass it around. If you are interested and you don't want the long English version, you can get this because it's very cheap and easy to get. The English original is out of print and you'd have to get, um, they, should, they should republish it. I don't know why they don't. But since they don't, you just do what you have to do. The other one I also have not read yet. I've only flipped through it. But my other main concentration in my own research besides phonetics is morphology. And there is not a lot written about Chinese morphology. I mean, in the mainland there's a lot more than there is in the rest of the world. There are some things that have been written, but it still is not a highly developed field. And this one looked pretty good, a pr like a pretty good introduction. So if you want to know more about Chinese morphology, you might have a look. It's called Han Yu Su Xue Tong Lun. So this one looked pretty good. Anything about Chinese morphology, I usually will buy from Ruo Shui Tang. And if I haven't mentioned it before, don't be afraid of Jian Ti Zi. Yes, you can read it. Don't tell me you can't read it. Of course you can read it. You don't have to like it. Nobody has to like Jian Ti Zi, but when you need the information, you just use it, okay? 
that's those two things. Um, in addition, I think that's all we need this for, so I'm going to put this back up. These are the books that I mentioned, and I couldn't find one of them originally on the list. It's number three, William Smalley, A Manual of Articulatory Phonetics. This is also out of print, but there are many copies in the library of Taida. So if you want to borrow one, you can do that. The other one I was referring to is by Katrina Hayward called Experimental Phonetics. I got that on the fourth floor, I think, of the NTU library. And I'm not necessarily recommending it. It's an okay book. It's good enough. I mostly learned what I learned, um, what I read in this book from other sources. There were a few new things in this book, but mostly, for example, I learned from Professor Johnson's book, Keith Johnson's book. I already knew a lot of the stuff in it, but it was, it was good, a good review and I picked up a few things. And the thing about the leaf on the tongue, I think it was William Smalley. Both of them have hints on how to make an ejective. The leaf on the tongue, I think, was William Smalley's idea. I think that's that. So we can continue. Are there any questions before we, continu uh, before we continue? Let's go. Next. Um, Miranda, another way of learning to produce an adjective is to start from the usual American and common British pronunciation of button. And that's not what they have written there? As a button. There we go. And also, it's not American, it's American. American. Mer. Mer. Uh -huh. American. Okay. Try starting to say button, but finish. Button. button. Yeah, if you say button, it's not going to work. It needs to be button here. But finishing with another vowel uh, instead of the nasal n. All right, let's take it step by step. Everybody first say button. 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 Now, we're not going to say the N at the end, we're just going to say uh, and that will be easy because it's often pronounced that way in Taiwan English, but mm. <laughs> Well, not so often, but you often leave off the nasals. Um, so, but uh, but uh, okay? All right. Sort of like butter in Cockney. Go on. If you make sure you do include the glottal stop from a form of t. Uh? Try it again. The glottal stop form of. Oh, oh. Glottal stop form of. Mm. Of t. Uh -huh. The result will probably be. But t. t. Mm -hmm. If you say this slowly, you should be able to convert it first into. But. T, um. But. Uh. But. Uh, but put a T after the glottal stop. The way I said it just now, there was no T. But after the glottal stop, put a T. So it's but, t, uh, but, t, uh, okay, but, t, uh, but, t, uh, uh huh. Then into but, t, uh huh. And finally, altering the stress into but, t, okay, but, t, uh. But uh, sort of spit out the air in your um, vocal tract from the T before you make the vowel, because the vowel will turn it into pulmonic air. We want glottalic air. So, but, uh, but, uh. Again? But, uh. That's it. That's it. Okay. So Miranda can now tutor as well. You've got it. Good. Annie, eventually you should be able to be, be able, ah. able. Mm -hmm. Put it on your list. That's basic. That needs to be fixed. Can you write it down quick or mark it? <coughs> you should be able to produce sequences such as p a, t a, k a, and perhaps ch a. Ah, 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 as well. Practice producing adjectives before, after, before, before, after, and between a wide variety of vowels. You should also try to say the Lakota mm -hmm. words in Table Six Point One. 
But if you find、嗯、you 不要放噪音 But if you find adjectives difficult to produce, don't worry. How do we say that? Those last two words. Don't worry. Yeah. Many people take take years to learn to say them. Just keep on practicing.、Mm -hmm. Say on. 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 You're saying on, on the on. We want 安全的安 R N on. An. Yeah. An. Yeah. Not an, but a.、Uh. An. Now that an is right, but watch the vowel. An. An. There you got it. Good. Okay.、Um, was that all clear? He was saying that、um, once you know how to do it, once you get how it works, then you can try other consonants and vowels as well. So let's try the ones he gives us. A. 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 Push out the air, and it won't make any sound at all. That's why they're voiceless. So, everyone, that's the kind of sound that children make when they're playing, right? That's an adjective. So, if you don't have it yet, this might help you. It's not. You can hear the breath. That's a totally different sound if it's lung air. This is just glottalic air. Okay. When you're done with that, then add the vowel ah, 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 and you can make it even smoother and faster. Ah, 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 ah. Okay. And that's why they call it jinhoin, because when you say them fast, what you're doing is you're just tensing up your vocal folds. So ah, ah, and that's why when I give the example from Georgian, like university, you can hear eh, 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 creaky. So basically, it goes down to your creak. That's how it sounds in running speech. Is creaky, and let's try an affricate as well. Ah, ah, just like 喝茶的茶 but we're gonna push the air out before we get to the vowel. Ah, ah, and then s is hard because air comes out fast for fricatives. The air comes out fast, and you don't have very much air at your disposal. When you're using glottalic air, you just have one little column of air there to use, so you have to make it fast and forceful, and then it's done. It's it's like fireworks. Boom! It's gone. It's gone. It's done. Okay. So ah, ah, ah. Try to make this with glottalic air. You don't need to put the vowel on yet. You can't you can't keep it up very long. There's not much air yet, and there's not much air in there for you to use. And s takes up a lot of air. Ah, ah, very good. Okay. Then it says that we can try the Lakota words in Table Six Point One. Let's try those. And you've got. Oh, you don't have the table, so I may have to turn on the projector again. Okay, those are the ones that we've already tried. So I'm not going to open that up. We did try them last time already. The o and uche, etc. We did those last time. So let's let's keep moving.、Mm. We're moving on now to a new kind of exotic sound, and this one is harder. I'm going to warn you. Now, don't make that make you feel like oh, I'm going to give up before I start. But I'm just saying that if you don't get it right away, or even after. A good bit of practice. Don't be,、um, don't be frustrated because implosives, at least in my experience, for some reason are just harder. Ejectives, most people get them maybe within a couple weeks. Some take longer, but for implosives, some people really have problems with these. These are also a glottalic.、Uh, they use a glottalic airstream mechanism. Let's read about them first. Let's go. It is also possible to use a downward movement of、oh, the downward mouth. Downward. Down. I want to hear the end. Down. There we go. The first time I heard downward. <coughs> Everybody, listen to the difference. Downward, 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 downward. Can you hear it or not? Listen again carefully. Okay. Taiwan English first, and my English second. Downward, 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 downward. Can you hear it or not? If you if you can't, please tell me, because then I'll do it slower, and then we can try and. Listen to it more carefully. Can you hear it or not? Listen again. Downward, down. 强调一点的话就比较清楚 right? Down. There's no n. 
downward, 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 down, tongue is up there, downward. Now, do you get the feeling? Do you have that feeling or not? Or you're used to this already? <laughs> but we native speakers, we notice it right away, but we don't know why it sounds funny. We only know that downward sounds funny. Most native speakers cannot tell you that the N is missing. They don't, they don't know how to analyze it. They can only tell you downward does not sound native. It sounds like it has a foreign accent and it sounds odd. That's all they can tell you. You don't want to sound odd, right? And you want to learn how to enunci enunci er, pronounce clearly, have good enunciation. So put your tongue up and you've solved it. Downward. downward. Not down. Down. Your tongue tip needs to be touching your alveolar ridge. Downward. Downward. Down, not down, down, down. I ao o the ao, ao, ao. Downward. Good. Everybody, it's in your notes, please. Let it be in your notes. Okay, go. It is also possible to use a downward movement of the larynx to suck air inward. Stops, make, stops made with an aggressive glottalic airstream mechanism are called implosives. All right, implosives. That's our new type of sound that we're going to learn. Implosives. And I think, did I put them up here? I didn't, and I will put them up today. And some people call them shiru in, shiru in, but it's not really the best translation because it's not just sucking air in, and it's not pulmonic, it's glottalic. We'll learn more as we go on. Let's continue. In a production of implosives, Implos it's not z, it's oh. yeah. implosives. The downward moving larynx is not usually completely closed. The air in the lungs is still being pushed out, and some of it passes between the vocal folds, keeping them in motion so that the sound is voiced. Mm -hmm. Figure 6.3 shows the movements in a voiced bilabial implosive of a kind that occurs in Sindhi. Sindhi. Sindhi an Indo-Aryan language spoken in India and Pakistan. 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 Mm -hmm. Implosives sometimes occur as allophones in English, particularly in emphatic articulations of bilabial stops, as in absolutely billions and billions. OK. Now, I'm sure that this is ito <laughs> wushui. We're going to have to take it bit by bit. These parts we're going to have to take slowly. and. Instead of pushing the larynx up, pretending you're singing a high note, how do you push your larynx down? Pretend that you are singing a low note. So when you start high and then push your larynx down, you're going to take that air in your vocal tract and you will suck it in. So in your mouth, Sing a high note without singing. Now lower your larynx. There's going to be a space. Originally, I better use two hands. So originally, your, your larynx was here, and then you lower it to here. With, with the lowering of the larynx, there's going to be more space, right? And that means that we're going to have to suck some air in to fill up the space. Otherwise, it's going to be a partial vacuum, and there will be pressure. Right? So that means we start out like this, we lower our larynx, air is going to get sucked in because we've got more space now. So that's the first part of how implosives work, but that's not the only thing that you do. The second thing is going back to ejectives, are they usually voiceless or voiced? Voiceless. Voiced ejectives are, are really, really rare. I don't know of any language that uses them, but I've read about them. It's very hard to produce a voiced ejective because You've got your glottis closed. How can you voice it? So I don't know how it works, but I've, I've read that there are some rare languages that use voiced ejectives. So let's just consider them as always voiceless for our purposes. Now, impulsives are different. You're going down, and then you're going to produce a voice sound. Implosives are usually voiced. And I believe there are voiceless implosives, more common than voiced ejectives. But implosives are normally voiced. And it probably has to do with their origin. Remember, we had a special word for the origin of tones. Do you remember that word? Wow, good, you got it. Tonogenesis. That means the emergence of tones. Well, 
the emergence of implosives goes back to a very, very strong voice stop. 就是那个 voicing 非常的强 Sometimes 它是强到那个喉头会下降，然后呢，空气吸进来。Bill， 它、呃、就 Bill， 它变得很很非常的 voice 以后，有时候那个喉头还会下降。然后吸一点空气进来，它是这样产生的。Originally, they were highly voiced sounds, very voiced sounds. That's how implosives, as far as we know, came into being, and that's why they are usually voiced.、Um, so, in addition to having your larynx go down and pulling in some and, and sucking in some air to fill the partial vacuum, if they are voiced, that means what? You now know that implosives are usually voiced, so therefore that means what else is happening down there? That's right. Your vocal folds are vibrating, and if the vocal folds are vibrating, does that mean that we have a tight seal like we had with ejectives? Ah,、uh, no. They're opening and closing. So we have. That's why "shiru in" is not such a good translation for them because you do have air being sucked in, but at the same time you have what kind of air? Pulmonic air, lung air, coming out to make a voice sound, to make a voice stop. In this case, so we've got air going in both directions, and that makes them a little confusing and hard. But you can learn it. Okay, and I'm not really good at them. I can produce them, but I usually make a gulping sound. 如果 If it's a native speaker who has implosives, they don't have that gulping sound. They sound much more natural. And if you're just listening to the recording, it's very hard to hear that they are different from regular voice sounds. They just sound like very voice sounds usually. I, I will play some examples for you. Use earphones, and you will hear it more clearly. So even though I will play them now, you will probably need to go home and use earphones and listen yourself. But even so, it's not that easy to hear it. But because I'm not a native speaker of one of those languages, and I'm not, I'm sort of a mahuhu at it, I make a gulping sound, which makes them very clear. So you'll learn a clearer version from me that you'll have to tone down if you learn one of these languages, like Cindy. The way it works is, for example, for a、ah, ba, it's ba, ba. You can hear ba. My my lips are making too much noise. They shouldn't make that much noise. Ba, mmm, mmm. You can hear if I'm voicing, if I'm making a voice sound, my vocal folds are vibrating. And then I'm lowering my larynx. That's the sound we make. And close your mouth so that you don't have air coming in, and you'll hear it. Mmm, mmm. Just like you're swallowing without opening your mouth. Mmm. And you can hear the pitch going down, right? Mmm, mmm. And don't say mmm. That means your nose is open. You can't open your nose. Mmm, mmm. Everybody, just plug your nose. Plug your nose like you're gonna go swimming. And then close your mouth. And then lower your larynx while you're making a voice sound. Mmm. Mmm. Yeah. Be careful about pinching your nose. That will make sure that you don't have nose air coming out, but you might pop your ears. So be very careful. Be very, very careful when you're doing that because Taiwanese students tend to use nasal sounds, and if you're using a nasal sound and plugging up everything, you will either suck your ears in or blow them out, making some of these sounds. So don't do that. <laughs> don't harm. Don't harm your ears. So. If you know how to swim, if you've been underwater and you don't want air or water going into your nose, you have to plug your nose like this, right? This is what you do when you're going to go underwater. That's what you need to do. No air is coming in through your nose. Okay? <laughs> Sounds like I have a cold. We talked about that last semester. So you plug your nose, close your mouth, have a little air ready. Mmm. 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 Okay? That's the beginning of an implosive. Okay, if you're having trouble, 没有关系可以练习 And those who know how to do it, again, Carol and anybody else who's mastered it. I just noticed Carol because she's right here and I can hear her really clearly. But the rest of you who've mastered it, if any of you need help, get help from a classmate who can do it. So now we're going to impose, superimpose a stop on that, and it will be B. So, ba, ba. So while the larynx is going down. You can hear that pitch going down, but it's also creating a partial vacuum. So if you open your mouth, air is going to rush in, and that will create the implosive. Ba, 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 ba. In addition to Cindy, there are quite a few languages in India, I believe, in that area that use them, 
And also Vietnamese has this sound, but it's allophonic, according to what I know. I asked a Vietnamese and he never heard this sound. So not everybody has it. But I have heard other Vietnamese who made the sound. Clearly, I heard it. So, and I've read also in the literature that it's allophonic in some varieties of Vietnamese. So, ba, ba, ba. So try to make that mm sound and then add a b to it. Ba, ba, ba. All right, practice that. That's an implosive, and you can do it with other stops as well. Da, da. Okay, you're using your tongue to block your mouth now instead of your lips. For B, it's bilabial, so it's easy to close up your mouth because you've got your lips together. Ba, ba. Make the mm sound first, and then open your lips. Everybody, ba, ba. Okay, you can do it with D, da. Da. Mm. So I have a strong mm sound which native speakers usually don't have, but that shows you how to do it. Excuse me. Da. 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 Mm. Da. All right. G is harder because that space left to work with is very small. Da. 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 Okay. Those are implosives. Okay, they're a little harder, aren't they? Okay, I warned you. But practice it and you'll get it. Um, so if you really strongly voice a stop, like a B, you may sometimes inadvertently produce an implosive. And that's why they gave this example. And we voice our stops strongly, for example, when we're broadcasting the news. I say we. I don't broadcast news. I broadcast other things. But normally in speech, it was Amy who read just now, right? Right, and you said billions and billions without voicing, which is the normal way we say it. In the news, though, we tend to emphasize theoretical standard features. Like in the news in Taiwan, you still hear zhi zhi zhi, right? You will hear that in the news, right? Sometimes, yes, sometimes people are more relaxed. But you will still hear zhi 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 in the news in Taiwan. Well, in the news in English-speaking countries, we often have strong voicing on initial stops, which we don't have in conversation so much. So they will say, billions of dollars, billions of dollars, instead of the way I normally say it, which is billions of dollars. Big difference, right? So billions of dollars have been spent on the project. Billions of dollars, and that way I sound more like a broadcaster, because they will emphasize these theoretical <clears throat> underlying features that we don't necessarily use so much in conversation. And if they really overdo it, Billions of dollars, billions, they may produce an implosive. That's what they're saying in this line. Kima, let's go on. From Bella. <clears throat> in all the implosives we have measured, the articulatory closure. Articu. Articulatory uh -huh. closure. In closure. This closure, in this case, the lips coming together occurs fir first. Occurs first. Occurs first. Good. The downward movement of the glot glottis, which occurs next. Which occurs next. Which occurs next. All next. Right. If you say which occurs next, then next didn't get any stress, but next is really important here. So we say which occurs next with continuation rise, stress and continuation rise. Which occurs next. Which occurs next mm -hmm. is like that of the piston. Piston. That, a piston that would. Cause, an, uh, cause a reduction in the pressure of the air in the ocean. Slow down just a little bit and make your thus a little clearer. I know you're saying the thus, but they're really short. They can be a little longer. So you can say um, um, a reduction in the pressure of the air, rather, in the pressure of the air. I, I barely heard the the. So in the pressure of the air. Uh, uh, in the pressure of the air mm -hmm. in the oral tract. Or. or Mm -hmm. Oral tract, Good. but it is a leaky piston. But it is a, it is not a, is not a content word. But it is a leaky piston, in that the air in the lungs continues to flow through the glottis. Okay, stop a minute. You read it correctly. Piston is a shizu, but it's repeated. So, but it is a leaky piston. You read it exactly right. Okay, go on. Um, as a result. As a result, stresses on. Let's just go over this quickly, because a lot of you still have trouble with where the continuation rise goes. Where do we put the continuation rise at the end of uh, uh, an intonation group? 
Where do we put the continuation rise? What syllable do we put it on? Louder? Is it the last syllable in the phrase? For example, if we added two function words to this phrase, your phrase is as a result, right? If we added of this, as a result of this, we could do that. That's, that would also be grammatical. Where does the continuation rise? Does it move because we've added words? This is really an important point. This really should go in your notes because I think most people here, first of all, they don't know about continuation rises. And once they learn about them, they don't know exactly where to put them. But there's a very easy rule for them. And you actually know it implicitly, but you maybe haven't really made the connection. If I put the continuation rise on this, which is a, which is a function word, it would be as a result of this, we could do that if we wanted to emphasize this. That, that's possible. But that's not what we normally do because this is a function word and it has no stress. So what do we do? We find the tonic stress. Remember the final stress syllable is the tonic stress. So that's an easy way to, to know where to put the continuation rise. It starts on the tonic stress. No matter what you've got there, if it's a phrase, a sentence, a compound, just a few words, the tonic stress is where your continuation rise starts. And it can also finish there if you have no, more, no further words. So for example, as a result, we have to put that whole little song on zult, on that one single syllable. As a result, zult, it's all on that one little syllable. If we put of this after it, then what do we do? As a result of this, we put the tail of the continuation rise on those function words. But salt is the tonic and that's high. So we can't say the continuation rise goes on the last word. It starts on the tonic stress, which is the last stress syllable in the intonation group. As a result of this, everyone, as a result of this, as a result, of this, as a result all right, these two actually form a very good contrastive pair. So if you ever need to teach anybody about this, keep this. You can say it's not the last word, but the int uh, continuation rise spreads over the remaining words in the intonational group. So as a result, go ahead, Bella. As a result, the pressure of the air in the oral tract is not affected very much. In a plosive but there is, of course. There is, of course. There is, of course. Yes, I just told you not to stress, but now we do stress it because... In the preceding sentence, he just said, Why? Because we have air coming in and also air going out. So that way, they sort of balance each other out. Okay, um, But here it says, although they don't affect uh, the, the oral tract pressure, the air in the oral tract, the air pressure in the oral tract is not affected very much, there is, now we stress it, because with, contrast with what? Is not. 前面说 is not. Hey, 可是确实有,还是有, and you will lengthen 有 in Chinese. 没有这回事,不过还是,这件事情还是有. You, you, you will put a glottal stop there and lengthen it in Taiwan, in Taiwan Mandarin. So we need to stress it here to show the contrast. There is, of course. There is, of course, an increase in the pressure of the air in the vocal tract mm -hmm. when the articulatory closure is released. There is neither an, an, an explosive nor, in a literal sense, an implosive action. All right, this is going to get confusing. Implosives are hard anyway, but they get confusing because we've got air in two directions. It says in a plosive B, he's, he's making a comparison, an implosive with a regular plosive. So with ba, ba, 
the air pressure stays about even. Air is coming in, air is going out. With a normal plosive, we do have an increase of air in the vocal tract. Ba. We've got an increase of air pressure you can feel. Make a very strongly voiced ba. Try. Ba. Ba. So there you've got an increase. He's contrasting the implosive with a regular plosive. That's what's going on here. And then uh, he says, when the articulatory closure is released, there's neither an explosive nor, in a literal sense, an implosive action. So, because don't worry too much about the contradiction. Um, it will make sense once you know how to do it. You'll be able to feel it. Let's go on. Instead, the particular quality of the sound peculiar. Uh, oh, the peculiar. The peculiar quality of the sound arises from the complex changes in the shape of the vocal tract and in the vibratory pattern of the vocal folds. Very good. It's the way the vocal folds vibrate and it's the shape of your vocal tract when you're producing the sound that gives us this unusual twang. That will take experience. Okay, next. In many languages, such as Sindhi and several African and Native American languages, implosives, languages. languages okay. implosives contrast with contrast. Plosives. Natives will say contrast as well. We don't really um, pay much attention to this distinction, but we're going to be really rigorous here. Um, implosive contrast with plosives. Mm -hmm. However, in some languages, for example, Vietnamese. 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 Okay, because the tonic is on ease. Vietnamese. Vietnamese. Mm -hmm. Implosives are simply R. R. Was it R? R. O. R. Implosives are simply variants. Variants. Alpha. Variants. All right, when it's an important word, you need a nice tonic there. Implosives are simply variants, allophones. That's a good way. Implosives are simply variants, allophones. Mm -hmm. mm, variants, pause. Remember that Biao Dian Fu Hao usually tell us to pause normally. And this is the case here. This is a good way. So you have to give it sort of lazy good D way. So um, implosives are simply variants, allophones. Implosives are simply variants. Not var, var. Variants. Uh -huh. Allophones are voiced plosives. Voiced plosives. Voiced plosives. Mm -hmm. And are not contrast in low with low sounds. And are and are not in contrast with those sounds. Oh, <laughs> are not in contrast with low sounds. Okay, that's what I just mentioned. In Vietnamese, they do have ba and they have ba, but they're the same sound. So you can say ban or ban, it doesn't matter. It's just a variant. It doesn't mean everybody has it, but if you hear it, it doesn't create a new word. It's not a separate phoneme. Okay? The top line of table top. six. Top. The top. The top line of table 6.2 illustrates implosives in Cindy. The symbols for the in, for implosives has have a small hook on the top of the regular symbol. For the moment, we will consider only the first and the second rows in table, in table 6.2, which illustrate aggressive glottalic stops, implosives in the first row. Contrasting with the regular phonic plosives Pomonic. in pulmonic. Ma, ma, pulmonic. Pulmonic. Right. Pulmonic plosives in the second row. Okay, let's stop there for a minute. Look at this table at the bottom of the page. A regular post plosive is written like this, and implosives will have a little hook to the right. So that's easy to remember. And when you're writing it, you can just write it like this. So that's b, b. Mm-hmm. 
And then you can see for D, it's the same pattern. This is a regular D, and then you just add a hook to it to make it implosive, and you can write it like this. Well, write it like this maybe is a little better. Um, let's listen to these files. This is the first one, upper left-hand corner. If you just listen to it without this kind of preparation, you would just hear a B, right? Bunny. But it's bunny. Bunny. Okay, listen again. Bunny. 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 Can you hear that kind of sound? If you listen carefully, you can hear it. Bunny. Bunny. Listen again. Bunny. 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 It's funny, and when I, when I hear this, I have another memory. At this time, it's not about my kids, though. It's about Mr. Casey. M Mr. Tim Casey, do you know him? Some of you had him for, for a teacher. Our Jiao Si Yan Jiu used to be next to this room downstairs. And so after class, Mr. Casey said, Karen, what was all that bunny, bunny, bunny stuff in your class? Because <laughs> they could hear it really clearly in the office. Um, so I think of that every time. Bunny. I feel Tim. What is that? What is that? Bunny. 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 Let's compare it to the one right below it. Now, it's not a good minimal pair because it's got a ooh at the end, bunu. But see if you can hear, hear the difference. Bun. Bunu. It's still very voiced, but it's no longer an implosive. I'll play it a few times. Don't repeat. Just listen carefully. Bun. 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 Banu. It's very strongly voiced, Bun. but it's not an implosive. Let's go back to the implosive. Bunny. 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 Implosive. Bun. 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 They sound really close, don't they? This one's really hard to hear. But listen to the bunny one a lot, and you'll get a feeling for that kind of resonance in the vocal tract. Here we don't twang. Here we don't. And it won't come fast. It will take a little time. But a lot of these things will require time because they're new. And I think that I didn't quite finish my idea first hour. When I said when something is hard to learn, I started it. When something is so new that it goes against things you've learned before, people will usually do what? If it's so new, it's so different from everything you've been taught before, what is, what is the normal human reaction to ideas like that? Right, you reject it. You just reject it. You go, know, no, I learned something different. That can't be right. That's not what I learned. Isn't that what most of us do? Like when I try to tell you new ideas about Juin Fu Hao, everybody's up in arms. No, 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 it's this way. I learned that in first grade. And I've had that experience with many things because in my years of experience teaching, I've learned some things that I have not seen in the literature. And when I try to tell other people about them, even people in my field, they go, oh, that's interesting, and then they forget it. Like, for example, the echo method. The echo method is revolutionary. That's something really new, I mean, really different. You can't say it's new because it's always been in all humans, the possibility. But people have not really mentioned this as a way to improve language learning. So when I mention it, they go, hey, I'm going to try that. Or else they go, oh, that's interesting. And then they totally forget about it, and people do things the old way. So I've had that experience many times with many ideas that I've had myself and listen to the reaction, even to people who are experts. That's usually what happens. And over time, if you persuade a lot of people and they find, oh, this is useful, I'm going to do that. Finally, if you get a momentum going, then if a lot of people already accept it, then maybe people will pay attention to it and consider it seriously. So for you yourselves in the future, if you're going to be a researcher, you will find the same thing. If you come up with something really new, really original, look forward to a very difficult time in telling other people about it. Okay? And for any new idea that's quite different from what you've had before, and these things also require coordination of your brain with your articulatory muscles, it's going to take a while. And I posted an article on NTU phonetics, if you saw it, about why tongue twisters are so difficult. Did you see that one? And they talk about these are the finest movements that we make in all of our body. Remember we said that about the tongue? Those movements are so very finely timed and coordinated. 
the brain is really amazing that it can actually pull that off. Okay, so it's something that's really, really difficult to do, um, but we managed to do it somehow. And here with this, you're going to have to learn some new movements, some very fine new movements. All right, and let's just finish the paragraph. That's our bell. It's okay that we only got that far because each day we're getting a new thing. Last time was ejectives, this time was implosives. And that's actually quite a lot for one class. Let's just finish the paragraph. Cindy has unfamiliar places of articulations illustrated. Mm, your asthma. Uh, articulation. Articulation. Artic no, arti ah, it's R. R. Articulation. Right. Illustrated in the third and fourth columns, which will, uh, which we will consider in chapter. Ten. Not con, ten. Which we will consider, uh -huh. which we will consider in chapter seven. Good. The lower row, uh, the lower rows in the table illustrate phonation types. Phonation. Phonation types that we will consider later in this chapter. So we're not going to spend time on those, but we will come back to them in the future because we're going to learn a lot of the things going on in those other examples that we're not ready for right yet. Right now, we're just mainly interested in implosives. So please mark that. It's the first complete paragraph on 142, and then Vivian is next, right? All right, and you will go next time. Um, let's just remind ourselves of what you need to do. What do you need to do? There's a new article you need to read. It's Shi De, article number 77, which is about nasals. And you also, on your own, need to practice what two kinds of airstream mechanisms? Ejectives. And now, Implosives, try it on your own. Listen to the audio files and see if you can learn how to produce them yourself. And have a look at the book nook if you want to know some other books. If you want more practice in unusual sounds, the William Smalley book is really interesting. Mm. Okay, take good notes and I want you to actually execute the plan that you've made for yourself, working on correcting whatever it is you're focusing on this week. And then on Wednesday, we will go over uh, your summaries of vowels and consonants, chapter one. Okay? We'll see you on Wednesday.